Kashi Delay, and welcome to Tibet Talks. I'm Ashwin Verghese of the International Campaign for Tibet. Today, we have an amazing true life story for you. It's a story about a puppy, a bright eyed, pure blood Tibetan mastiff who was abandoned and alone, waiting on a trail in what was once the Kingdom of Lo on the Tibetan Plateau. And it's a story about a man, a veteran career diplomat who had traveled all around the world, but was destined to cross paths with this puppy. And it's a story about an illustrator, a member of the International Campaign for Tibet, whose work had been blessed by the Dalai Lama and who helped bring this beautiful book to life. It's called The Ambassador's Dog, and it's available now from your favorite booksellers. Having read this book myself, I can assure you that it will touch, lighten, and uplift the hearts of adults and children alike. And it's now my pleasure to introduce you to the author and the illustrator of The Ambassador's Dog. Please join me as I welcome Ambassador Scott H. DeLisi and illustrator Jane Lillian Vance. Scott and Jane, thank you so much for being here today and welcome to Tibet Talks. Thank you very much, Ashwin. It's a great pleasure to be with you and with, with all of your followers here. Thank it you. is a pleasure to join you, Ashwin, and to be with my fellow sister International Campaign for Tibet members and all people who have learned the beauty of Tibetan culture. Well, we're so excited to have you both here today. And this is really an exciting conversation. As I mentioned, it's a really beautiful book. So thank you both for being here. We'll get started with the conversation in just a moment, but first one quick housekeeping note for all of you who are watching from home. If you're watching this live and you'd like to ask a question for Jane or Scott, please post your questions in the comment section of our Facebook live post or email your questions to comments at safetibet.org. So please share with us your questions and we'll try our best to ask our two guests the questions before the end of today's program. With that, I'd like to introduce the moderator for today's discussion. He is the interim president of the International Campaign for Tibet. Please join me as I welcome Bu Cheng Seri. Bu Cheng La, thanks for being here and I will turn the program over to you. Yes. Thank you, Ashwin. Sorry about this hiccup. It's a privilege for me to be in conversation with Ambassador Delacy and Jane on an interesting book. Uh, but before I do that, Ambassador, uh, I note that you are very much engaged with Nepal, even after you left your duty there. You have an organization called Engage Nepal, and right now Nepal is going through trying times, both politically, but more or sort of uh, similarly with the uh, uh, COVID-19 situation. So wh what's the situation in Nepal right now? Uh, Bhutan, you're absolutely correct. It's a, it's a tough time right now in Nepal, and I won't, I prefer not to talk about the politics because I don't do politics anymore. Uh, this is one of the joys of being at least semi-retired. Uh, but the humanitarian situation is so, so difficult right now. The second wave of the COVID pandemic has been just devastating to the country. Uh, the number of deaths has grown exponentially. Uh, now more people have died than died in the earthquakes in 2015. We have seen huge pressures on the health system, the lack of oxygen, the lack of basic medicines, the fundamental needs of the people are striking. At the moment, food has become the next crisis. And this is true throughout the nation. And it's being compounded at the moment by a very intense start to the monsoon season. Uh, horrific flooding. Uh, it's just, it's about as difficult as can be. Yet, you know, I always remain hopeful. The people of Nepal have shown over the years that tremendous resiliency, that tremendous spirit, that tremendous ability to overcome hardship. That is part of what endears them, I think, to so many people who come to know them. Um, so I'm hopeful but we are doing our very best at Engage Nepal. And I know the countless organizations across the country and around the world are reaching out and trying to step up because governments alone cannot do this. 
it really requires the concerted partnership of the international community extending a hand, a hand in compassion, a hand in friendship to make the difference. Thank you, Ambassador, for your social service. And those uh, individuals who would like to know more about this can go to the Ambassador's website. Sure. Engage in uh, We'd be happy to share information uh, that anybody might be interested in. So that brings me to my next question. Uh, you have served in more than half a dozen countries as a <laughs> diplomat for the United States. I, I try to look for any publications you may have done for other countries that you served in. It looks like, uh, unless I'm wrong, this is the book that uh, sort of you ended up writing uh, through this. So why Nepal? Uh, you know, Bo-Chang, I'm, I'm asked this all the time, why Nepal? Um, I think there was something tremendously special about the connection that, that both my wife and I felt to Nepal and to the people of Nepal. I've been engaged with Nepal in one way or the other since my first trip there in 1982, when I was a young officer serving in what was then Bombay. But especially during my service there as an ambassador, you came to appreciate the physical beauty of the country, which was a just a tremendous joy for our senses. And you came to appreciate as well this tremendous diversity and richness within the culture. You have so many different communities and each with their own traditions and richness. And that became a great joy. It fed our intellects. That was great. But the people of Nepal, and in that I include the Tibetan community that I came to know so well when I was working there as ambassador. There was something there that the tolerance, the gentleness, the compassion, the the willingness to share the generosity of spirit. And that touches your heart and that captures you. And that is why, although there's great need in many places in the world, and we all know this, I felt that perhaps I could make a contribution through my engagement in Nepal. And because the people of Nepal had so touched me, that seemed like the right place for me to direct my efforts such as they are now that I'm no longer full-time with the State Department. And now coming to your book, before I go to Jane, uh, the book in its simplest term is about you going to Mustang and finding a dog and then coming back and keeping the dog right. with you, who is named Loki. Uh, but within that, there's so many layers that we can unravel. So yes. before we do that, how is Loki now? Uh, Loki is fine. He is he is a, he is a wonderful dog. He's he is suffering a little bit. His knee joints are hurting a little bit. He's showing the signs of age, as am I. So he and I are sharing the challenges of getting a little bit older. But you know, he brings that same determination and wonderful spirit that he's always had. And we still go for our walks, and we're. We're getting him some laser therapy on his knees, and I think he's going to be doing much better in a week or so. Yeah, so what uh, took you to the Mustang region? Uh, was it diplomatic reason or was? No, it was it, it was largely diplomatic. One of the great joys of being an ambassador, you get to do all, many different things. And one of the things that we do is we have a wonderful program to, to assist with cultural preservation, the Ambassador's Cultural Preservation Fund. And we had been doing some projects in Mustang, and we were also exploring the opportunity to do more, to further engage with the people in preserving a heritage and a culture that's a gift to the world. And so we had gone up to uh, visit some of the projects and look at further opportunities. And I will admit it was quite an adventure knowing that we had this chance to trek to Lomantan um, and to experience another dimension of Nepal and of the, the culture of Tibet that is so prevalent there. So we were very excited to make this trip. And, uh, to continue that uh, with Jane, Jane, I think as an artist, uh, you have uh, used your talent, uh, but at the same time, I see that in the book, you bring in uh, the Tibetan Buddhist influence everywhere. Uh, of course, the uh, the nature of Mustang being a, or, uh, in a Tibetan cultural context is uh, something that's inescapable to people who visit there. But what made you uh, sort of uh, 
be interested in the Buddhist cultural uh, artistic culture? Well, Chong, the answer may be something like reincarnation, because there is no other way to describe how a young woman from the American South, whose parents had never traveled to Asia, found her way like a bloodhound to the right place where um, all of the ideas, not just the images, seemed so attractive to me. So in our book, as you succinctly outlined, it is the story of a man finding a dog and bringing it home. It is. It's also the story of that dog's heart having a wish. And somehow the Tibetan culture, better than any other for, for my money, has taught that a wish somehow, and it seems magical, but the wish opens a series of events. A fervent, resilient wish has a power to open a series of events that leads to the fulfillment of that wish. And if that can be so, and Tibet's teachings teach me it can be, I want to show that to people. I want to show that delays end up being perfect timing and obstacles end up being, in fact, doors. So this nearly magical avenue to fulfillment, I have learned the most from Tibetans, and I want to show it in my art. So was it also karma that brought you uh, to be connected to Ambassador Delacy to collaborate it on this? It was karma, Uchung, it was karma, and it was also a beautifully embossed invitation from the American Embassy. Uh, before I met Ambassador DeLisi, my friend now Scott and his wife Leah, I was returning from my own trek to Mustang and presenting a film I had made about a large painting about uh, a Tibetan Amchi Sampanawam. And we were on the trail on one of those many high peaks, the ups and downs of walking into Upper Mustang. And there was a runner who delivered a note and the ambassador had heard about our film and said, would you please bring it to the embassy? And, you know, I was overjoyed, of course, but I couldn't have foreseen just how simpatico our ideas about spreading the knowledge and the wisdom of uh, Nepal and Tibet to the world, uh, our relationship would be, but it has been so. And Ambassador, uh, in the book, you tell the story almost from a dog's perspective. But at the same time, uh, there's lots of spiritualism in it. As what is identity? What's belonging? What's even a name? And who is where? And how is fate involved in it? So have you been interested in spiritual all, spiritualism all along and particularly Tibetan Buddhist spiritualism? Or was it something that you uh, experienced while going to Mustang? I think that it, it's part of a journey, Chung, as you know. I mean, and we grow as the years pass. And the, the book, as you said at the beginning, yes, it's about a man finding a dog. But there were many different layers in there. And what has fascinated me is what people have found within the book. I did not set out to portray it in a sense as a book about a spiritual journey or anything else. But the fact that I lived in Nepal, that I had journeyed over many years and had encountered so many different people and cultures and faiths and sets of beliefs and I was so deeply touched during my time in Nepal by my own engagement with, with Buddhists, with Hindus, with the Tibetan community, and coming to understand and appreciate further their, their understanding, their perspective of the world in which we live. Inevitably, that colors our thinking and it begins to shape us as well. And when I wrote that book, as I say, it wasn't with the design, it was just to tell what was a story that was in my heart of a moment that truly did touch me and that mattered. And the words just flowed and that that story 
came out. And all of these influences were very much embedded in it, but it wasn't so much a conscious thing as just a reflection of of all that I had been exposed to over the years, I think. And Loki is a Tibetan mastiff. Yes. Uh, I think in, ne in Nepali they call it, as you mentioned in the book, Bote Kukri. It's my Bote Kukri, yes, Kukri, indeed. Kukri, yeah. <laughs> Tibetan dog, something. Uh, going from there, uh, when you went to Mustang area, uh, your book mentioned that you were going to Lok Kekar Monastery. Is that yes. one of the monasteries that was being benefited uh, from the U.S. Embassy's assistance? It was not one of the, the, uh, the monasteries that was being benefited at the time from our assistance, but it was very hard when you are in that area not to visit such a treasure. So we did. And having the chance to visit the monastery it gave me the chance to meet a puppy who's, who was living right at the foot of the monastery, if you will, just before the last climb. And this all seemed destined <laughs> to be, as you were saying with Jane, karma did play a role in all of this, not only in the meeting of the, with the puppy and the, that choice to, to build that relationship, to be connected. But with Jane and with when we told the story and a, a publisher in Nepal who believed in this, every step of this journey has seemed to just fall into place as we've moved along. So it was really quite something. But I do remember the, the monastery in particular. It was just such an incredible and powerful visit. Um, and it was capped by going back down the hill and rejoining with that puppy and deciding that we were meant to be together or actually accepting the fact that he had decided we were meant to be together. Exactly. That's very, very well told that <laughs> I think sometimes man believes that we are everything, but we don't realize that uh, there are other creatures who are as uh, powerful as us. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think one of the things about the book that touched many people was that sense of connection between sentient beings. And it's whether we are man, whether we are dog, whether whether we are a cat, it, it doesn't matter. There is a connection that exists. It truly does. And being open to this. And that's part of what the book is about as well. It's asking people to remember there's, that as we journey into the world, there are so many opportunities for us to find beauty, for us to find engagement, to find, for us to find wonder. But we have to be open to this. Our eyes have to be open to it, and our hearts have to be open to it. And Jane, uh, in the book, uh, the, there is a uh, message by an artist in the Mustang region, I suppose, uh, with whom you had uh, connections. Uh, was <coughs> it from him that you learned the, the this style of painting that the, which we call uh, Tibetan Buddhist or Tibetan cultural painting? Or and who is he? Um, the, the Lama, who has been my mentor, and with him I traveled, and who would tell me the Tibetan stories about why the landscape was covered the way it was on the way to Lokekar Monastery. Um, he lives in Kathmandu now. He is from Jomsom in Lower Mustang. Um, and like everyone in Kathmandu, he's under a lockdown now, facing challenges, but I had him come to my home in Virginia probably five times. The last time he called Buchung and he said, my wife and I are coming and we're not leaving your home or going down your driveway for a month. We're doing a prayer. And it must tell you how close we are that I thought how wonderful because he wasn't company, he was family. And yet he's also a teacher to me. I did observe him and talk to him and I always tried to see His Holiness the Dalai Lama when he was anywhere near. And sometimes His Holiness would all, uh, make a, a kind of remark that would guide me as an artist. And so I would say that Amchi Sampa and His Holiness have taught me sort of the core reasons to be cautious and brave as an artist. But I have also studied assiduously on my own I have a library of beautiful Tibetan work. And then again, when you go to some place like uh, Lomantang and 
uh, a conservator like Luigi Fini is working on the walls and restoring the, the broken murals and telling stories about how he understood from just the remnant of a hand mudra what god or goddess that was you began to learn a great deal so my expertise and my courage come from these teachers and from hard work yeah some of these knowledge uh, sort of comes alive in your illustrations in the book i i think and the way you bring in uh or if you add value to the text that uh, Ambassador Delisa has written. Uh, Jane, uh, when you call him Amchi, Amchi in uh, uh, Tibetan language also means a doctor. Was he a practicing Tibetan medical doctor? I'm asking this because also uh, when we talk about uh, survival of Tibetan culture or, or the uh, value of Tibetan culture, Tibetan medical uh, treatment uh, process is also very much part of that. And, uh, Yes, sir, a huge part of that. And he is, was uh, a 10th generation Amchi. And it was he himself who went by foot from Bhutan to um, the Terai over to um, different parts of Nepal to collect the specific recipes that would vary given terrain and the differences of climate and soil the different recipes of specific amchis. The amchi in Lo can use an ingredient that the amchi in Bhutan might not have. And so he collected like a cookbook of um, amchi recipes and he presented this to his holiness. So he, he has been awarded by the government of Nepal as uh, an encyclic, encyclopedic figure of knowledge, Amchi Medicine. I myself, when they became available, bought the two volume uh, book about the blue barrel, the practice from the fifth century of Tibetan medicine and looked at all the tankas that showed uh, the interest in medicine that all Tibetan Buddhism is really intertwined with. And then one day, uh, a group from Atlanta, a monastery from Atlanta, Georgia, were coming through my university town and had heard that I was there and they ended up having many meals at my home. I think that would be the people monastery. Yeah. Yes, exactly, sir. And though my home is small, we would end up having people who had been to their um, entertainment, their, their dances, their explanations of Tibetan Buddhism, and they also built a mandala at the school and so everyone would come to my home and there was an old monk, I wish I knew his name, but his face was so kind. And when he saw these two books, he teared up and said, oh, you know, I didn't know this had been published. This is a treasure. And I, he, I sent them off with him. And uh, he said, no, no, you can't possibly give them to me. And I said, sir, I'm just the conduit there for you. And when I gave him that book about, um, Tibetan Amchi medicine and, and the blue barrel and the encyclopedia of medical texts and tankas. He took my hands and he looked at them and he examined them like a map and he said, oh, I see. Um, as long as you are working with Tibetan subjects, you can do anything. Thank you, Jane. Ambassador, now coming to the Tibetan community in Nepal, with whom you said you earlier you mentioned that you had interacted, and we know that the U.S. Embassy in Nepal has been very much active in uh, providing assistance to the Tibetan community there in Nepal in various ways. So how do you find the general situation of the Tibetan community there in terms of pre preservation of culture, in terms of community spirit? It was a hard time. Uh, now, I, and I haven't, I haven't been to Nepal for a couple of years. I was due to go last year, but of course, COVID got in the way. <clears throat> I had hoped to go this year, but again, I'm not sure that circumstances will yet allow. But when I was there, I saw a community that faced such great challenges. It, it was just it, the challenge of maintaining identity in a nation that was unwilling to grant you the citizenship, the access to education, the access to employment opportunities, 
that you might have expected for long staying immigrants or refugees in the nation. Uh, and I'm not saying that disrespectfully of the government of Nepal. They were under great pressure. There were many challenges as they tried to address these issues. But we were committed to being champions for the community and trying to help them address some of these basic rights that I would argue that any refugee community should, should be granted when they are long staying like this. And who is more vulnerable than a refugee community, right? But at the same time, despite these problems, I saw a community that came together, that fought to preserve their identity and culture. I still remember being just so deeply touched time and again, we would go, <laughs> we would go and visit the community in the Kathmandu Valley. And we would go to the, the home for the elderly. And we would go in and see people who were cared for, who were loved, who were cherished and who were respected for what they could offer their community still and to sit and hold the hands of an older man or an older woman to just be with them and give them that time and that respect and to see how well cared for they were by their community. That was really touching and it was really inspiring. Again, this is part of what makes you identify with the community and say, this is something that we care about. To see young people who were frustrated, no question about it, who weren't being given the opportunity to fully express themselves or to use their talents, but they still found ways to engage and to make a difference. And I remember going up and every time I'd go to Pokhara, we'd go and visit the community there as well, the settlement there. And we would sit with them and they knew the challenges. They knew that we couldn't wave a magic wand and make the political realities suddenly better for them. But they were patient. They were always good partners. And to sit with them and to drink butter tea, and this was my first experience of butter tea, um, and it became an acquired taste as we went along. I visited often enough that I came to truly appreciate it. But to talk about how we could help, and it wasn't always the big things, but just to, to bring books for the library for the children, to bring soccer balls for the kids to play football, to, to let them know that they had friends, that they had someone who cared. So this became an important part of what we did. And yes, you're right, the US government did care about this issue. And I was honored that we, that we did. And I was proud that we stood for them because had we not, I think that the Chinese pressure on the government of Nepal might have led to different outcomes sometimes, especially as refugees came across and as they were seeking to, to transit through Kathmandu and then make their way to India to join the Dalai Lama, to ensure that their rights were respected, that they were safe, that they had sanctuary and that their journey was completed. And to, and to advocate with the government of Nepal for certificates of, that recognize their, their entitlement to at least certain basic benefits. Uh, this was all part of what we did. I would have liked to have seen greater results, but at the same time, I know that the mere fact that we raised our voices, that we were advocates, that we cared, and that the government of Nepal knew that this was important to us, ensured that, that there would be a degree of protection and a degree of thoughtfulness in the choices that the government made about how they would engage the community. And you're right, Ambassador. In, in our meetings, often uh, in the past, not in recent times, in the past when we met Nepalese officials, they would informally tell us about uh, their sympathy for the Tibetan people, but, and, but also the pressure that their government faces from the Chinese government to do many of the things which brings, brings discredit to Nepal, which the Chinese don't consider. Absolutely. But, yeah, but uh, please, please go ahead. And no, I was just going to say, and it, it was interesting, I think one of the, I seldom sought confrontation. As a diplomat, we don't seek confrontation. We seek to ease confrontation. But there are times when you have to stand for what you believe. 
And I remember on, how oh, was it? It was one of the international days marking ref, the day of refugees or whatever it was. But I remember writing an op-ed that was published <laughs> in the papers in Nepal. And it caused a little bit of a stir. And I must admit, I think it it was not intended to provoke the Chinese ambassador. That was not my intent. But it was my intent to speak to basic values that we believe in as Americans and the dignity of all people and the importance of protecting those who are vulnerable in the world. And I will say that I think that I did manage to upset my Chinese counterpart, but these these words needed to be said, this message needed to be delivered and the US needed to stand for it because there are times when our nation is able to stand for those who do not have a voice and we speak for those who who otherwise will not be heard. And if we fail to do that, we fail to honor the essence of who we are as a nation. And so I was thrilled to do that. And I will admit I was I was very touched some months later to receive a letter from His Holiness uh, and who had heard of this, who had seen this, uh, had it brought to his attention and who recognized it and who just sent a note to say thank you for the efforts that our government had made uh, to stand with the people of Tibet. Continuing with this thinking, uh, given the fact that you had, uh, while serving in Nepal, you were able to visit Lo Mustang area, I don't know whether you've been able to visit the Sharpa areas or the other I did. communities, I... who all share the same Tibetan Buddhist culture, Tibetan culture, and whose uh, to whom the Dalai Lama is as much a spiritual leader as he is to the Tibetan people. So what would be your recommendations from these to the Nepalese government and the people to see by supporting the Tibetan culture, Tibetan community, they're not necessarily uh, doing a political act, but supporting their own citizens and their culture. Oh, you know, th this is so very true. And one of the things that struck me was how these Himalayan mountain kingdoms, if you will, but the how the cultures come together and how both the religious and cultural traditions just come together so harmoniously and so constructively and so positively for the people of the region. And yes, the people of Nepal, the, the Sherpa community, you know, these are Nepalis, but they share the Tibetan culture and Tibetan faith, the Buddhist faith, and they, they the government of Nepal really would be well served to protect and to think about these things. But Bhutan, I and I will say this with great respect, I, I think that this is a compelling argument that a responsible government should consider. But the political leadership of Nepal, and I went through multiple, multiple, multiple governments during my time there, they're, they are still on their own journey in terms of maturing as a democratic state and as a, as a political, as political leaders. And I think they need to look beyond just the quest for power or for political position to ask what real leadership means for, for their nation and in terms of their relationship with others. And they have not, so these sorts of arguments, while I think they made great sense, I don't think that they resonated much with the political leaders of the day because they weren't thinking in those terms, but I think that they resonate very much with the people of Nepal and that they recognize this brotherhood and sisterhood that transcends what particular community you are and recognizes the shared humanity and so much that overlaps. And we had, you had asked if uh, the monastery at Lomantang had been one of the, uh, or at uh, Lokegar, had been one of the ones we had supported and it was not, but the monastery in Pangboche oh. up in Solukumbu, which was the last permanent settlement on the way to Everest and was the one of the oldest monasteries in Nepal. That one we did support and I had been honored to trek there as well. I didn't meet a puppy on that trek, but I had a wonderful experience nonetheless, as we saw how important this gompo was to the community. It was the heart of everything. And people were so grateful that we cared and that we built this together and that we made, that we made a difference. And the Lama there was just such a wonderful man. 
and we shared so much joy as we celebrated the the reconstruction of of the monastery there in Pangboche. And that too for me was an experience that I will never forget. Yeah. Though I will say we were so as we sat there with the Lama and as people came by to to pay their respects to the Lama and to say thank you. And one blessing scarf after another would go around our necks. And soon the blessing scarfs were up over my ears. And the you might think that they do not weigh much, but when you have hundreds around your neck, they do. And we laughed about this many times since, and we have some wonderful pictures. But that moment was was truly a special moment. Uh, and uh, it, as they say, all of these things, and that happened before I went to Mostan. But again, all of these become part of shaping what ended up being the story of Loki. And I think we can hear Loki speaking uh, through you. Yes. Uh, at the moment, someone came to the door, and so the dogs, uh, I, and Loki happens to be in the garden now back at the moment. But his voice is hard to miss. Jane, I think if I'm not mistaken, what brought you to the Mustang region was a village to village uh, connection that you had that took you to a trip there, or was, was it just part of uh, the mission? How did you uh, begin your connection with the uh, region there? When I asked for men, uh, from His Holiness to be the first Westerner, the first female to do a lineage painting of a Tibetan Anchi in the tradition of lineage paintings, and I got a yes. Uh, I bless this project and I bless the film you will make about it. I did that and the festival to receive the gift uh, was held in Johnson Village in Lower Mustang. And then the man in the painting, my friend Anchi Sampa said, we should, we should travel by foot to see uh, the then king, uh, Jigme Parar Vista in Upper Mustang and show him uh, photographs and tell him. And maybe if he decrees, we could show the film on the uh, outside of his uh, palace wall one night. And so we brought a generator and our machine, and we tracked to uh, Lo, and we had audience with the king. He watched the film, and he said, I want this shown, and on July the 19th, I'll never forget, um, that year we uh, showed the film outside during a terrible and wonderful rainstorm in Lo Montan, and the whole village stood in the rain and watched the whole film. It was beautiful. And is this the video that's available online? That uh, It is, and it's called A Gift for the Village. And, and uh, the image paint, sorry, Ambassador, please. No, I was just going to say, if I may add, this is the film that brought Jane and I together initially, that connected me as well to Anchi Sampa, who ultimately blessed Loki when Loki and I came back from from the hills and stayed in Jamsam at his at his little lodge. But when we showed that film, and this was the, the beauty of, the, of Jane's work, this built this tremendous cultural bridge, not only between the community in Virginia where the Amchi had taught and a village you know, in, in Mustang in Nepal, but between people of the United States and the people of Nepal, between people of different faiths, it was a bridge of understanding and it opened up the door to understanding of the tibetan culture and faith to so many and it was a it was a wonderful film and it still is and this is this is how we begin to build understanding and partnerships globally so jane jane's work of diplomacy and bridge building was tremendously important and i just urge people to to take a look at this film because it is truly powerful. Uh, it touched me deeply. And when we premiered it in Kathmandu at our home with Jane and with the Amchi and with so many from the community, there wasn't a single person who wasn't touched. And that's very well put, Ambassador. Jane, where, where can we see the lineage painting that you mentioned? The film Buchung is actually about that lineage painting. 
It's about right. painting being made in my home in the mountains of Virginia. And you actually see footage of the painting being painted in progress. Right. And then rolling it up and taking it uh, across the world, which was something I did not know how to do. And <laughs> it's never a question on Jeopardy. How do you take a giant lineage painting from Virginia to Mustang? But I figured it out with my film team and um, my great desire to bring the gift to the village. It's all about that uh, painting. Luchang, I would say I have, you can't see this very well, the lighting isn't good, but I have a, a small image of it from Jane that hangs in here in my office uh, next to me every every day, so. Thank you, and I think uh, some might wonder today uh, why the International Campaign for Tibet is doing this event on a book about Nepal and book about uh, a dog. So <laughs> I think through our uh, uh, conversation, it's become clear that the Tibetan struggle is less about a political struggle, more about the survival of a culture and identity which goes beyond the political borders of Tibet. Uh, Absolutely. Through Nepal. So if that being said, and Ambassador, I want to bring uh, your attention back to your diplomatic uh, position of the past and to your current connection with the State Department, etc. What do you think the United States should do more to help resolve the Tibetan issue? You know, I again, I always hesitate to opine on these things. I'm retired. There are others who are addressing these things, and I know how complex these issues are, Bo Chong. It's easy, it's easy for us from the outside to say, oh, well, we should do this, we should do that, we should be more forceful, but these are always complex. But we can never forget that even as we deal with the, the bigger geopolitical struggles and the challenge of how do we deal with China on so many levels, that there is a human story and that there are individuals whose lives are affected, whose lives are forever changed, whose lives are lost as part of this struggle as well. And we have to remain conscious of this and we cannot, we can never let our pursuit of our interests cause us to forget our fundamental values. And this is an inherent tension that any nation faces as they engage in their international relations. But I would hope that, and I, I know that our values tell us that we must support the aspirations of the Tibetan people that we must respect their rights and their dignity and the preservation of their culture, that we must care about these things. And it has to remain every bit as much of how we engage and what we talk about when we speak to the Chinese as where we stand on issues of global trade or any of the, the bigger challenges of, of free seas or anything else that we, that we address. And just as President Biden reminded Mr. Putin yesterday, that as an American president, we can never, we can never look a leader in the eye and not speak about human rights and still be a good representative of the American people. That same message, I think, carries on when we are speaking to the Chinese leadership and anyone else in the world. I think that's very well uh, said, Ambassador, and that's what we at the International Campaign for Tibet is also striving to convey uh, here in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere. And so I I'll, end this, I'll end this session over here and hand you back to Ashwin to see if we have questions. Thank you, Bu Chang, and thank you both of you for that uh, for that really wonderful conversation. Um, we do have a few questions coming in from some of our viewers, so I'd like to share them with you now. First of all, we have a couple questions that came in by email from Connie Orkut, and Connie, thank you for these questions. Uh, so Connie has questions for both of you. So first uh, she asks, for Ambassador DeLisi, um, starting on July 14th this year, the U.S. will temporarily suspend the importation of dogs from countries that the CDC considers at high risk for dog rabies. Because rabies is endemic in dogs in Nepal, this will preclude the adoption of puppies like Loki by Americans. 
Um, as Nepal is struggling with so many issues right now, what protections do they have in place for abandoned dogs? Um, I don't know if that's a question that uh, you'd be able to speak on or if you have information about that, but uh, just throwing it out there for you. I, I saw the report about the CDC action, uh, which was done because, again, so many of the rabies uh, vaccination certificates in a number of countries have been forged. And because there was such a surge of importations, I think, during COVID, because people were looking for that connection that we spoke about earlier, right? Um, I can't really speak to the specifics of it, though, and not having been in Nepal of late or anything else. I do know that I have been in touch, though, and working with a, a wonderful woman here in Virginia who is very much committed to the issues of protecting of animals in Nepal. And I will pass that question on to her. And if I get a good answer, I'll pass it back to you. That would be great. Thank you very much for that. Um, Jane, Connie also had a question for you. And uh, the question is, uh, how did the symbolism, and so you, you sort of touched on this in your conversation with Buchong, but maybe this will give you a chance to kind of expand on it a little bit. How did the symbolism in Tibetan art inform your illustrations and which ones did you choose to put and which ones you chose to place on each page? I was particularly intrigued by the choice of what appeared to be coins on page 20. And uh, if it's okay with you guys, I will just actually show that image here. Um, so this is this is page 20 of the book. This is the image that uh, Connie was referring to with what appear to be coins on the lower half of the page. Um, Jane, yeah, so if you could talk about that kind of uh, how did uh, uh, symbolism to that in art and form the illustrations and how did you choose kind of which images to go with which parts of the book? Thank you, Connie, for that question. And I see that those shapes do resemble coins. They actually are moons. And <clears throat> I'm indicating the luminous passage of time in meditation, like the blue sheep is looking out over that precipice and promontory and may not realize how little or how much time has passed. When you become passionate or engaged deeply, uh, time slips away and more of it goes or less of it goes than we know. One of the illustrations I think Connie might like to think about is a double page spread. Ashwin, uh, I won't turn my attention from the screen, but it's the one of the Buddha in gold foil who's being rained on by candy. And here's the idea. Um, what if you are waiting, if you're hoping, and if things seem delayed for you, and they did for the puppy low key, but in our own human lives, sometimes things, the timing is not what we had hoped and we don't understand it and we quarrel with it. But Tibetan teachings, uh, Prajnaparamita on wisdom and compassion. Thank you, Ashman, that was so nice of you. Allow us to gain the practice of faith. It's a strong, resilient, not passive faith. It's active faith, where we realize that what had seen the obstacles or the delays or the monsoon of troubles actually becomes sweet. And so that candied monsoon is what Loki the puppy is experiencing. And Scott okay. himself is in the story. So with a kind of faith that things are going to work out if you work hard all along the way, how do you take that and show it as a painting? That was one way I did so. Jane, if I can add, please, yeah, please. I, I think it, it's, it's somewhat amusing that recently we were going to boost a posting on Facebook that included that illustration. And this is why we need to build understanding of culture. Uh, and now I think I'll blame it on artificial intelligence at Facebook, but they rejected the posting because they thought that the image of the reclining Buddha was showing too much skin. So, <laughs> So one never knows what you're going to encounter as we try to build these cultural bridges. Um, but I think Jane would agree with me as well. The, the other part of your question, Ashwin, had been about the placement of the images in the book. And although we certainly had a role to play, but our publishers of Vajra Books in Kathmandu, the care that they took in helping to create that layout was just 
it's so so heartfelt. I mean, they they love the story as much as Jane and I do, and the care that they took, I think, to create that perfect combination of placing images with text. Of course, it all needed the artist's approval, but I think Jane, you you found it to be acceptable for the most part. It was right? a, a stunning partnership and typical of work with Tibetans that it becomes a circle of nations. Uh, so Vajra Books and Vidor Dangal and his group in Kathmandu had the best design team in the world. And they shipped the book down to New Delhi to Archana Press, a venerable press. And so this was an international uh, effort like putting your shoulders to the wheel, as the Indians say. Uh, very, very exciting. And let me just say, Ashwin, also in response to Scott's uh, nice quoting of Joe Biden, uh, I really like what you yeah. um, extracted, Scott. I also liked when Joe Biden said, I told President Putin, we are not doing this against Russia. We are doing this for America, for democratic values. And I would say that His Holiness has that same democratic pure urge to help the most people to do the most good and the least damage. That's why recently I watched a podcast with His Holiness talking to Greta Thunberg about environmental activism, and it wasn't Vladimir Putin who talked to Greta Thunberg. And see, and Jane, and those values, those are the values that informed my work as a diplomat over 35 years. I think those are the values that are inherent in who we are as a nation as well and that shape, hopefully, our engagement with the world. And it changes a bit from administration to administration, but I hope we're back on the right path. And I hope that all of these partnerships will continue to grow. Thank you, thank you both absolutely for that. And uh, I'm glad also that you had a chance to uh, praise the publisher who did such a great job in putting the book together. And that kind of leads to another question that I have here. And, um, the question is about whether you've had the opportunity to share this with the Tibetan community in Nepal, if you've heard reactions from Nepal, and um, are there Tibetan and Nepali versions of the book, or will there be, um, where, is, where is that kind of process? You know, um, the book is, is being marketed in Nepal by Vajra Books, but again, the, the pandemic has made this much more difficult. Part of the reason I had hoped to travel to Nepal last year, and Jane has hoped to travel to Nepal, is we would love to launch the book and do this in a way that also was in partnership with the Tibetan community, and maybe even bring the young man who found Loki back uh, to Kathmandu to join us for that celebration. Uh, but right now, that's all wishful thinking. But Jane, you had ideas about a Tibetan version, I recall, right? It was my friend, uh, Jill Harrington, who said, why don't you imagine a Tibetan long book like the classical texts uh, of the books in a Tibetan library, uh, a long wooden book that you fold over and have long pages and do a version of the ambassador's dog in Tibetan book style with carved wooden covers. We look forward to doing that. And we would have it in Tibetan and in English. Isn't that a great idea? We haven't, yeah, we haven't given up on this yet. Uh, but you know, this is all being done by Jane and I. I mean, we don't have an American publisher. We don't have an American distributor, but we, it's an act of love. It, it truly is. And it's a story of love that we wanted to share. And I will just add, because I think it's important for people to know that a share of the proceeds of this book are going to engage Nepal to help the people of Nepal. And Loki was very honored the other day to donate $1,000 uh, to engage Nepal. I hope they'll be able to donate more. I'm talking to him. He's a very generous and humanitarian dog. Uh, so we, we will see what the future brings. Thank, thank you for that. I really appreciate you mentioning that note. And um, we're actually running low on time here, but um, I wanted to get to one final question for, for both of you. Um, so as Bhutan Law well knows, next week we are beginning our Tibetan Youth Leadership Program, which is an annual program that ICT runs. And we'll have about 11 Tibetan American college students or recent graduates taking part in this program. And the idea is to give them exposure to the US political system, to help them understand how policymaking works in the city, 
and to um, train them really so they can be the next generation of Tibetan American community leaders who move forward the policies and the goals that this community has uh, through the US policymaking process. Um, could I ask both of you as we end here, what advice would you give for these young Tibetan Americans to help them as they develop into the next generation of Tibetan community? Uh, if I may, uh, I'll go uh, I'll respond first. Ashwin, try to be short. But this work with youth is one of the most tremendously important things that you can do. And it was something I committed myself to both as ambassador in Nepal and in Uganda. And it it's so critical and it enriched me, but that chance to listen to young people, to empower them with the skills that they will need to confront the problems of the future, it's priceless. But in engaging with them, we must listen to them and understand what it is that they are concerned about, what they aspire to and what they want to do. And to those young people, I would say it's, Change does not come as quickly as you would want. It doesn't come usually with a great dramatic peal of thunder and suddenly the world is, is cast anew. But it requires a dedicated and long-term commitment and engagement. And when we care, when we bring the effort, we can bring about change. It might be incremental, but we bring it. And if you bring that passion and the energy and the commitment, you can drive change, but you've got to have the passion and the energy and the commitment. And I hope that they will bring that. And the final thing I will say is the Tibetan youth that I engaged with in Nepal, and I saw what they did for their community and how they strove to overcome hardships. They inspired me every time I met with them. And even today I have in the hallway upstairs, a tanka hanging that was painted by one of the young Tibetan women who was one of the great leaders that I worked with so much and it was her parting gift to me and I'll always treasure that. So do the work with the youth, it matters. Jane, over to you. I would say speak to the young people and uh, they are walking the Appalachian Trail like my friend Iris, they are doctors, like my daughter Iris, they are lawyers with good hearts, like Ariel and Emerson. They are fantastic fathers, like my son-in-law David. They are advocates for re-netting a good, strong, responsible community. Don't be afraid of the last four years. Uh, the American heart is generous and curious and strong. And I would say, as ambassadors of Tibetan thinking and of Tibetan culture and heritage, please know you are an equal to America. We look up to you. So do not feel that you are small or should be quiet. We need you. America needs Tibet. The world needs Tibet now more than ever. So please know that you will be welcomed. They are part of America just as much as every other community is part of the fabric of our nation. And I hope that they will feel that and see that and help to help to preserve and expand our cultural understandings. Thank you both so much for that. I think that's a really wonderful note to, to end on. And it's great advice, not only for our youth leaders who will be here next week, but for all Tibetan American listeners, and really, there's been a lot of uh, really encouraging discussion here today from, uh, from both of you. So thank you. I know I certainly feel motivated from listening to this, and I'm sure uh, all of our audience members do. So thank you both again for being here. Thank you for supporting and being members of ICT. We truly appreciate that. It allows us to do what we do. And thank you once again for sharing this book, The Ambassador's Dog, which, as I mentioned, is available now. And we highly encourage all of you to listen to it. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you, Buchan, for, uh, for leading this discussion today. So uh, thank you as well to our audience members and everybody watching from home. We will be back next month with another episode of Tibet Talks on July 22nd, featuring author Michael Van Walt Van Prague alongside ICT board member and Asia expert Ellen Bork. Together, they'll discuss the new book that Michael co-authored called Tibet Brief 2020. So please join us again for that. Learn more at safetibet.org slash live. We hope to see you next month. Thank you again for joining us today on Tibet Talks. 
Till then, stay safe, stay well, and stay active. Thank you very much.